I've previously spoken with the manager in reference to this. Requests for proposals to be advertised in reference to this software management for the golf courses. It was, I noticed that of all the golf courses that was listed in reference to this request, that Stewart was not listed. And I would ask staff to explain to me or if this was an oversight in reference to Stewart not being placed on the list in reference to computer management for the golf course. And primarily, you know, this was an issue that came up last year as it relates to management of the course. And I think if we're talking about upgrading the system to make sure that we have the most that we can get out of the computer system as far as overall management, that this is one that I would like to find out why it was not listed on the list. Okay. Do you want that answer now or do you want to get to you later? Or later. Councilman Kelly and I talked earlier and I understand his concerns and we'll see that we're looking to make sure they get added on. Thank you. All right. It's a short question. It probably has a long answer, I'm afraid. But on a lot of these pricing agreements that we've approved, we'll approve in this particular package. Yes, sir. There are multiple vendors listed as will supply or capable of supplying all the items in the bids. How do we go about allocating purchases to those various vendors? Do we have a rotation system or do we try to equalize it somehow? Laura Johnson here is here this morning to answer that very question. Thank you. Hopefully this won't be a very long answer. But in general, when we do a pricing agreement, usually what we do is we award specific items from a price list to each vendor. So there's not as much duplication as it might appear. For example, each vendor may have a different line of products that they carry and a different type of product that they carry. So we would be buying those types of things from that particular vendor. But there are some cases where we award the same product to multiple vendors and, of course, they have a slightly different price. We ask that the departments buy from the first available lowest price. So in other words, if the vendor that's on the list has the lowest price, we ask that they buy from that vendor. But that vendor may not have that product available at that time, in which case they can move to the next lowest vendor. Does that answer your question? Well, it explains how the process works. That's very good, Laura. Thank you. But let me clarify. If we list multiple vendors and they have responded that they can supply all the items to bid, then we just go to the one who has the available and at the lowest price. The lowest price, yes. Now, an exception to that might be if you're buying 15 items and one of them is a lower price and that's the most prominent item on your list, you could buy other items from that same vendor to minimize how many bills you have to pay, to minimize the delivery complications and that sort of thing by using the lowest price for the most prominent item that you're purchasing. So the bid price may be different on the bids, but the vendor is willing to supply a particular product for it. But if we sometimes will approve a vendor who has a higher price just to have the flexibility of going to multiple suppliers? Yes, because sometimes availability is a very critical issue. I mean, if you need pool chemicals, for example, you need them that day. You can't necessarily wait a month for a vendor to make a delivery. So you would buy from the vendor that had those chemicals available the lowest available price that day. But there's no attempt to balance the purchase between multiple vendors? We do attempt to do business with the vendors that are on our list. It's counterproductive for us to not buy from those vendors. But in some cases, if they do not have the product available at that time, we may not buy from them. Thank you. All right. Any other comments or questions on the consent docket? Any individual considerations? About both really exciting projects happening in Ward 6. And the first one is Item 6S. And it's a resolution asking for our support of a project involving the Wesley Housing 
Center, they're making an application to the Oklahoma Housing Finance Agency for some tax credit projects and uh, are asking for the city support both in terms of making that application and the commitment of $14,001 um, in our home funds to help uh, support that application. And I just wanted to point out that that odd number of 14,001 is that they get the maximum number of points available for their application on anything over $14,000. So that was the reason for that request, and it's a it's a project that's uh, located at uh, 12th Street. Uh, it's 300 Northwest 12th, and um, this was originally uh, an old hospital that it was built in 1920 as a municipal hospital, and it provides housing for um, elderly and special needs. It provides affordable housing for elderly and special needs folks, and they're going to spend about $40,000 per unit. Uh, to upgrade the facility, and it will result in uh, no new cost to the tenants, but a wonderful addition to the neighborhood. So it's a great project. Um, I need to object uh, about your use of the term old for that hospital. That's where I was born. Oh, Gary, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> a mature facility that just needs a little rehab, like the rest of us. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there's a historical marker. I would suggest Meg very... <laughs> I'm going to move on to the next item, I think, before I get myself in trouble. And uh, 6A1 uh, is another just fabulous project in town. I see Chris is here, um, maybe representing the Midtown Redevelopment Corporation. And uh, this is a project at uh, 1212 North Walker and then around the corner on 12th Street. Redevelopment of a fabulous building that's going to uh, result in 40 single-family units a 60-room boutique hotel right in downtown across from Stella in 1492 um, and uh, about 6,000 feet of mixed-use development on the ground floor. And so we're being asked to allocate um, some TIF $2 to help facilitate that project. It's a wonderful opportunity for the continuing growth of Midtown and very supportive. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Item 8A is a planning issue in Ward 5. Introduce Councilman Greenwell to deal with this one. It was recommended for denial by the Planning Commission. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I think we have the uh, representative for the uh, property, uh, David Box, here. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, members of the Council. David Box, 522 Colcord Drive. <clears throat> I'm here on behalf of Capitol Hill Baptist Church. Also with me today is Pastor Mark DeMoss and former Pastor Jim White. Our application today, and, and you're receiving right now a packet, uh, our application is for uh, SPUD 603, which will change the underlying zoning and permit a, a sign. In the SPUD, we limit ourselves to the sign that you're going to see depicted in your packet. It's a 20-foot sign <clears throat> with approximately 26.4 square footage of uh, EMD. Um, this is on a four-lane road that's southwest 134th which happens to also be a state highway. Uh, so when we looked at this, we felt that the, being a state highway and a four-lane road that carries a lot of traffic, that this sign was appropriate. Um, as I said, we are limited to what you see in your packet, and uh, I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Item 8B is a, uh, an access to an easement, and this will uh, finally close it. We have some few people here that have signed up to speak. Councilman Ryan, I know you've been working on this issue. Uh, Your Honor, thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, the neighbor out there, people who were opposed and in, in favor of this closing for their patience. This has been uh, deferred a number of times. It was originally it went back to uh, November. Uh, there was an effort made to some kind of resolution that was unsuccessful, and then so we decided we had to deal with it. I'd like to also thank the municipal counselor and uh, the director of public works. Uh, they assisted me on reviewing this easement and the legality of what we were doing out there. And uh, I, uh, I think it would be appropriate at this time, as long as these people have waited to have a say, to let them go ahead and do their speaking right now. Okay. Um, Carol Lamb. Councilman, and I was going to address the city manager and all of you council people. I appreciate your letting me speak to you. My name is Carol Lamb, and I... Uh, my address is 1208 Northwest 190th Place, and I am not here to restate my position. I have uh, written a couple of letters in which I think I have done that very well. 
I'm not here to defend that position. I am here to talk with you folks about, I do not know, maybe you've traced it back and you've found out how this could have happened. So I just want to tell you a little bit about what's happened. It has, this, I'm an old lady, and, but this, and I've owned lots of homes, but this is the first time I've ever been a part of a homeowners association. And this situation has caused even homeowners association officers to choose sides and not protect the rights of all of the homeowners as much as I think they should. It caused me to think even who I would ride to this meeting with this morning. It occurred to me that the builder who lived in that neighborhood and was actually a member of that homeowners association knew that this easement was there, and when he applied to build this house, some question should have been brought to this homeowners association to see if, what our position was. Wrong? You've got to choose up a side. This should not happen. We are a very small community, and we should be working together. And last June, well, we'll need your name and address for the record, please. I'm sorry. Tanya Sokolsky, and I live a second house from this easement, 1216 Northwest 190th Place. And so I'm quite involved in this situation. If the easement will be closed, people in the whole community, especially this one which is shown here in the center, will not have an access to the green belt. And in this case, our quality of living and our property's value will be diminished. You will understand this. We don't have an alternative access to the green belt. The south boundary behind our property, the south line of the home, has a very steep hill, and we can't walk. This hill starts right from the fences and goes into the pond area. Which is 204 Northwest 190th Place. I bought my property four years ago with the knowledge that the community included a common area with an access, which at that time was a vacant lot. I am one of two property owners on Northwest 190th who are disabled due to post-polio syndrome, which is a physical disability, causes a problem with mobility and with balance. I would not have bought my home had I known that the access could be taken away. The common realized that that access could be taken away from me, or certainly there would have been no reason for me to buy a home which included a common area that I can no longer use and enjoy. I'm here with and on behalf of Jonathan and Cindy Keekley. Cindy, stand up, please. And I'm going to share my time with her and give her, we're going to keep our remarks very brief and to the point. We've heard a lot about some implications of what the builders did. This common area, and you see it says common area. You see up on the map it says common area. It does not say park. There are no slides, no seesaws, nothing like that, which was the original intent of the easement. The builder never put in a park, and as you heard, the builder sold people property that flooded. And one other thing the builder did was they slapped up a home in an area that was supposed to be access to this park. And this is my property on 1224 Northwest 190th Place. And I am actually happy to get this nightmare over with. This has been put upon us for a year. Like everyone has said, it's an unfortunate situation. We, you know, feel like we're in the middle. We weren't aware 
and there's people pulling on both sides. Just to reiterate our concerns, the safe, our property value. Obviously, when we bought this property and we paid the price that we did, we were not aware of this. The fence was put in incorrectly. There was never a permit pulled by the builder or the fence company right up next to the easement. We don't keep our garage down all the time. Things could be stolen. The walkway is right by our daughter's window, our bedroom window, the bathroom window. It obviously wasn't a great place. If you go there, if you see it, if you look at the pictures in your packet, you can see this wasn't, it wasn't right. And from the statements of the planning commission, one member asked another member why the city was asking for this application for it to be closed and not us, the homeowners. The answer was because it was our mistake and we're just trying to correct it. 201 Northwest 190th Place. Okay. I've been in the neighborhood probably since the very beginning. We're a close neighborhood. All of us are. I probably use a common area more than anybody as far as I go fishing in the creek. I don't see very many. I live at 1212 Northwest 190th Place. I just wanted to say really quickly, I'm kind of catching up because I arrived a little bit ago, but I live next to the drainage plume. I'm three doors down from the Keithleys. And so I was not aware that that was even partially my property. But we have kind of talked, my husband and I, just that that was, we felt like that was a good option for access for those who did not have immediate access to the greenway from their homes. And even though, you know, one party might be willing to lend that right of traffic, I guess, it takes both. And so our homeowners association has not provided another option for our neighborhood. The neighborhood is made up of very fine people, both on both sides. I'm tempted to quote an old politician in Oklahoma I heard years and years ago. Some of my constituents are for it. Some of my constituents are against it. And I'm for my constituents. However, that wouldn't get us out of this issue. The planning commission recommended it be closed. And I'd like to ask if the planning commission representatives have any comments they'd like to make. Much sums it up. It was probably a poor design when it was done. We look back at the records. It was submitted with the original preliminary plat. There was no discussion about the location or anything. What we do now is we would have made that a common area or it wouldn't have been actually on that lot. We didn't make a recommendation on the planning commission staff report, but we identified the fact that to close this, they still have access off of Western Avenue to that common area. There wasn't any easy answer to it. There was mistakes made probably by a multiple number of people throughout the whole process, starting with the developer, the builder, the city. Like I say, there's no shortage of people who overlook things in the course of this thing. There are a number of times the homeowner's president who has withdrawn his objections because they were objections based on the access for emergency vehicles and ensured that emergency vehicles would not need that access, not even use that access that was available. The fact that the driveway is on the easement is a fact, but it's not against any of the ordinance. You can pave. That's an interesting fact, but it doesn't really bear on the issue. Having said all those things and after talking to a lot of people and going out there several times, I would move to accept the planning commission staff's recommendation. All right. Comments or questions from council? All right. The motion is to close the easement. Cast your votes. The easement closes unanimously. Code, and it's really a declaration on the electrical code. Last council meeting two weeks ago, Bob Tiener gave a presentation on the electrical code. He's here with his staff to answer any questions that may have arisen since then. All right. Any comments or questions before we vote on item 8F1? All right. I just got to make one comment. You all can roll your eyes if you want to. I think it's interesting that this one of the items in this code requirement upgrade is a change in the breakers in a house for public safety reasons. It's recommended by the National Fire Protection Association. It's endorsed by the Electrical Contractors Association. They say in the financial impact it's going to add at least $600 to the cost of a new home. 
but yet you haven't heard the builders coming forward rallying against it. It's a public safety issue. It's going to add to the cost of the home, but they seem to be all right with that, but we continue to fight the battle over residential sprinklers. So having said that, I'll move on down the road with it. Give me a shortened version of that, exactly what's going to happen there. They're increasing the requirements for sprinkling in the home? No, 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 no. This deals with the electrical code, and they're changing requirements on electrical breakers in the home, requiring more substantial breakers, different types of breakers, and it's going to increase the cost of a new home, they estimate, $600. Really? All on the premise of public safety, as recommended by the National Fire Protection Association. Good morning, Council members. Kenneth, I will need your name and address for the record, please. I'm sorry. It's Kenneth Kozak, 417 Southeast 46th Street. Okay. Good morning. I don't know where else to turn. I think I've exhausted everything I have attempted. There's a house that is next to my house that is empty, has been empty for years. The reason I'm here today is I need to make Pete White, I believe, aware of this. At this point in time, we have drug usage taking place in the home, open prostitution taking place in the home. I have some photos of the home. It is on the verge of falling over and falling down. I don't know if anybody wants to see the photos. Just pass them forward. Sure. Yeah, just walk on up. The address of the home in question is 413 Southeast 46th Street. The city has placed multiple notices on the property. They used to come and cut the grass. They did have it boarded up, but all that has completely failed. It has, I believe, one of the many reasons besides the economy, has decreased my property value of my home by $9,000. Name again? It's Kenneth Kozak, K-O-Z-A-K. And what's your address? It's 417 Southeast 46th. Okay. Let me do this. I'll have staff is here. I'll talk to them as soon as this meeting is over, and we'll see what we can do. Thank you. We can't always do everything, but they'll do the best they can. Thank you. We'll make it a priority. Thank you. Thank you.